women are entitled stationary measurement method. Time for the basics. Well, we're ready to get started now. So here's senior application specialist John Sloat and senior software engineer Matthew Hall. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we want to again welcome you to the uh, Sontec webinar stationary measurement method, uh, getting to the basics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, basically measuring discharge using the stationary method with our Sontec ADP. Uh, again, my name is John Sloat. I'm a hydrologist with Sontec. I've been here going on about nine years and uh, have a lot of uh, application experience in uh, measuring rivers and uh, me measuring discharge in rivers and I'll let Matthew Hull here introduce himself. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Hull. Um, I'm a senior engineer here at Sontec. I've been here about nine years as well. Uh, and I worked on the uh, stationary application software. Just an overview right now. Uh, actually, we're going we're gonna to talk about an introduction. We're going to give an introduction to basic discharge measurements. Uh, and for those of you that can hear that plane flying over, that's, uh, that's the benefits of living in San Diego, I guess. Uh, the station, it'll be gone in a minute here. The stationary, we're going to talk about the stationary ADP methodology. Uh, we're going to cover the measurement procedures, and then Matthew's going to give you a very extensive data review. <laughs> uh, so let's just begin with the, the basics and the most common. Uh, on the left part of the picture here, we have uh, two stream gauges uh, performing a weighting measurement, and they're basically using the stationary method uh, with a single point current meter. Uh, this is a tr very traditional technique. It's been around uh, for well over 100 years, probably more. Um, in the center, the, the, the picture to the right, uh, you can see the stream gauger is actually up there on a cableway. And if you look closely down to the river, you can see the, uh, the price AA, I believe it is, uh, down there. And he's performing a discharge measurement. On the far right-hand side of the screen is actually a data display from our Sontec uh, flow tracker. Again, it's a single point meter, and it uses the stationary method. Uh, to, to calculate discharge. The second common method, probably the most common in the up, up and coming today or the past 10 or 15 years, is a moving boat method with ADPs. Uh, this method uh, uses um, uh, bottom tracking or GPS or, or a, as reference to measure discharge. Basically, we start on one side of the river and continuously uh, collect velocity and depth data as we cross from one side of the river to the next. Uh, also, uh, we're not going to really talk about the advantages and disadvantages here, but uh, I, I will mention again here in the moving boat method, there's, I, I, I want to be clear, there's three basic methods that you can use to calculate discharge. Uh, the first, again, is bottom tracking, where we're using bottom track as a reference. Uh, the second is differential GPS. And the a third method that's, uh, I guess, recently developed by the USGS uh, is a loop method. And all, all three of these methods are, are very good moving boat methods, and they have some very apt very good application um, uh, uses in depending on, on the river types of the river conditions. The last here, you could call this the sort of the fourth method, if you will, uh, using an ADP to measure discharge is the stationary method. On the left part of the screen here, you see the uh, stream gauger standing out on a walkway and he's holding the river cat at a fixed position collecting data for 40 to 60 seconds or maybe a little more at uh, several, up to 20 locations across the canal. Uh, he's measuring, the, again, measuring the depth and velocity and calculating discharge. Uh, the center picture you see here, some cold looking hydrologists. Uh, this is in the Northwest Territories in Canada. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, deploying the ADP uh, at, at, across the uh, river, you know, again, using, it to, using the sta uh, what we call a stationary method to calculate discharge. And I, I, we, we put this picture here just to kind of just to give you a conceptual view of what, what really the stationary method is doing. It's, it, it's a methodology that's been around, again, for, for quite a long time. And really, uh, it's for those of you that have made point velocity meters or, or midsection or mean section types of discharge measurements, uh, we're really doing nothing new in that arena. We're just using a new technology. And you can see on the upper, the upper left is, the, uh, is a a, current, a point current meter attached to a cableway, and typically these instruments are used at, like I said, at points, at one or two points in the cross section, and they use that to calculate mean velocity. They lower the sensor to the bottom, and they use it to calculate depth. 
uh, with the ADP, everything can be done to the, with the surface. At the surface, you can measure your depth and simultaneously measure velocities uh, in, in, a, in a much more resolution than one or two points. We get a lot of questions, you know, Santec, why, why did you develop a stationary software when you, you have a moving boat software? Well, it, it really, a few years back, it started with a request. Um, it was a response to a request from Environment Canada, some hydrologists up there that had, had a need to measure, uh, measure in ice-covered rivers. You can see in the upper right-hand uh, picture, that's actually a, a, a point current meter that's uh, being lowered down through the ice and uh, the, they, they have a lot of difficulties and it's a very time consuming process so uh, we worked with them a little bit they actually provided a significant amount of feedback in the software that we're going to show you today uh, in terms of uh, being able to perform a, an actual stationary measurement uh, the lower picture you can just see the ADP going down in through the ice uh, as they're conducting a discharge measurement I'd also like to add that one of the advantages with using the profiler in this particular application is that instead of having to do lots of uh, single point measurements, in this case you get the entire profile as John mentioned earlier. However, you have less complications with uh, the instrument freezing over and things like that because you are actually measuring the entire profile in a much shorter time. And then once we once this software was developed, we we did quickly realize that that it definitely had application and need for uh, open channel type of measurements. So why, why, do, so why do we make the measurements? Well, uh, whenever you position a, a profiler uh, at a fixed location in a river for 40 to 60 seconds, you get a much better understanding of velocity profiles. Uh, it does overcome, it, it, again, it's stream gauging. We're measuring rivers. They change. Conditions change. It's very dynamic. And it, and in fact, it, it, it does very easily overcome and simplify some of the moving boat complexities. Again, it's your choice really what to use, but uh, it's like an, having another feather in your cap or another tool in your toolbox. Um, it is ver a very robust and proven methodology. It's used worldwide. Uh, I, uh, personally, we think it stands out quite, quite well in the high and the low flow conditions, in the extreme floods, extremely low velocities. Um, it tends to work, uh, really prove itself. A little bit about the basic definitions, just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, first of all, when we're talking about flow, of course, we're talking about the discharge in the river. Um, we have a, uh, in this figure here, it's a little bit busy, but we, we try to just give some of the basics, uh, where we define right edge and left edge of water as, st as, as looking downstream. So you would look downstream, and on your right would be the right edge of water, on the left is the left edge of water. Uh, each uh, depends on where you are in the world, you or what agency you work for. You can call each measurement point a station, a vertical, a vertical or a panel. Uh, you can see that located there. Uh, the mean velocity actually is the velocity is, is the mean velocity for each station, vertical or panel. Uh, the azimuth, uh, the az the azimuth is is actually the uh, typically parallel to the tagline in which you're use which you're using. The azimuth is actually measured from the uh, left bank to the right bank, and it's actually the angle relative to north. We get quite a lot of questions about the azimuth. In the software, there's a little diagram that shows you how to uh, actually measure it and how it is relative to the other features of the river. On the right-hand side of the plot, on the right-hand side of the figure, you see a plot here. That's uh, velocity uh, versus depth. And you're seeing that the, the red dots and the red line are the actual velocity data collected by the instrument. Uh, the blue line is this, the top and the bottom extrapolation method. So that, again, this is very similar to the moving boat technology because it's, it's, it is the same technology. However, we're just using it at a fixed position. Um, the, uh, let's see, I think we pretty much covered that one. So let's just, we're going to cover a couple of, of examples here. Uh, we're going to start with a flood in China, and uh, here we have the, me the, the conditions for this measurement. Uh, the, the measurements were performed from a cableway. It was a, a flood condition, extremely high sediments, uh, very, uh, very significant moving bed. Um, it, was an in, it was the interior part of China where there was absolutely no chance of DGPS. Uh, solution, the, the solution in this case, again, was a 3 megahertz river surveyor using the stationary method. 
So what you're looking at now are the results of the, of the discharge measurement uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is the, uh, well, let me describe a little bit about what we're looking at. This is the screenshot from a full transect in the software. On the upper, you see three plots. On the upper plot is a plot of the percent discharge with each panel. Uh, typically, we're going to go over the rules here in a little bit, but typically you try to keep at least 5% or less in each panel. In this case, you can see the red is indicating it's something larger than 10%. The, uh, the yellow is some 5 to 10 percent and the green is, is less than 5 percent. The middle, the middle plot is actually, you see the, uh, it, it's the velocity uh, vectors. The blue lines are actually, the blue vectors are actually the normalized velocity. That's the velocity projected perpendicularly from the tag line. Uh, that, that velocity is used to calculate discharge. The red vectors are actually the true velocity component and giving you the true speed and direction of the current at that for that panel. The lower plot is a, is simply a depth profile. You can see the discharge measured here was was 50.2. Uh, that's very close to the rated flow. Um, now, if you're looking onto the right hand side plot, you can see this is the same data. And in, rather than referencing the system, that's the ADP itself. We reference the bottom tracking. Uh, this is done by a simple switch of, of, we can switch the reference in this measurement so you can look at the, the ADP measured discharge and the bottom tracking measured discharge. On this case, we got 11.2 cubic meters per second directly as a result of the, uh, of the moving bed. Uh, you can see the velocities are, are significantly lower. It, it's quite obvious and that's the reason we're showing you this data is we, it, it's a very apparent moving bed. Um, but uh, again, one another advantage of this stationary software is you begin to look at you, you begin to look at very good uh, profiles of the of the moving bed. Anything you want to add here, Matt? Well, one thing I'd like to add on on the uh, when you look at the velocity profiles, when you look across the cross section, what you can see is that you can get an idea of the magnitude of the moving bed just by making comparison one to the other. The other thing is that you can get a good idea of the distribution of the effects of the moving bed, and you can see by looking at this, you've got it much faster moving bed velocities in the center of the channel than you do on the sides. Which I guess that, that seems to make sense. The, uh, let's see, the second example, this is a more common example, less extreme. Uh, it's in Mexicali, Mexico. It's a medium-sized irrigation canal. Uh, the problem here is there's vegetation, especially in the summertime, vegetation tends to grow, you know, quite a bit in these, in these types of canals. Uh, in this case, the vegetation is not really affecting the water velocities. However, it's, it is it, it, because it's al al along the river bed. It's not floating. Uh, what it did do is it caused difficulties with bottom tracking because the bottom tracking has, has sometimes will have difficulty when it's going across a significant amount of vegetation. Uh, the convenience here was there was a walkway at the measurement section. Um, I, it was, the measurement was about 200 meters downstream of a, of a small weir, and again, a 3 megahertz river cat was used using this stationary method. The results you see here on the, uh, on the, upper, the upper plot, again, is, that, is the projected uh, water velocities in the center here. You see the red lines are the true velocities, and the blue vectors are the normalized velocity. Um, Something that we noticed here, we can, number one, we can, with the stationary software, you can begin to see, because we, again, remember, we're collecting data at each fixed location for 40 to 60 seconds, maybe even more, we were able to be able to see a, a very unique horizontal velocity profile. Uh, using it, we, because we were referencing the system and not bottom tracking, we were able to overcome the, uh, the vegetation. Uh, issues. An an another, th uh, another thing, in this case, it's a pretty narrow channel, uh, so differential GPS is going to be difficult depending upon the grade and the quality that you use. Uh, the, the, the narrower your canal, the more difficult the GPS results, or the, the less reliable the GPS results will be. Um, the problem is we are losing bottom tracking, so uh, again, a loop method here would have been difficult. Uh, the measured flow here was 10.36, rated was 10.45, and again, the measurement time was ran about 26 minutes. So this is a more common approach. You can see, uh, again, we got a very good profile in the vertical as well as, as well as at the fixed locations in the horizontal.
So we're going to talk about site selection, some basic requirements, uh, some flow conditions, and some depths. And a lot of these were based on some of your feedback uh, when you signed up for this webinar, so we we're trying to cover these questions as best as possible. Uh, some of the basic requirements. Well, the one, hopefully, the most obvious is that you need to have access for your boat. Uh, you have to, to the cross section. You need something like a bridge or a cableway because, again, this boat, the boat has to be positioned uh, at fixed locations in the cross section. And so you need a cableway or a bridge or a, a small walkway or some type of pulley system. We're going to show you a couple uh, examples. The depths, of course, have to be within the minimum and the maximum range of the ADP. Um, we typically you'd like to minimize the, the amount of floating vegetation and debris coming down. I guess that could be similar for any type of discharge measurement. Boat stability. Th that's, that's probably one of the most uh, important. I think it's more important really with most any ADP type of uh, discharge measurement. And in this case, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to minimize any upstream or downstream movement because we are referencing the instrument itself. The side to side the, the, the movement side to side tends to cancel itself out. Also, um, Matt, why don't you uh, make some comments about the compass? Uh, well, the other thing we have is that when you're making a stationary measurement, quite often you get some rotation of the system. The system will rotate with the flow or possibly there's some wind conditions and things like that. As long as they're not significant, uh, that's okay and it typically will average out. The other thing is that because you're actually making a stationary measurement, it is important that you are using a system which has a compass because you need to be orienting the system or have some way of referencing the tagline itself. And so that's why we have a compass in our system and that's why you're putting in things like the azimuth angle itself. Yeah, then it, it, it basically allows the, the instrument to rotate about its axis and we'll still be calculating the the true velocity, which we can then uh, apply, it, you calculate the correct normalized velocity from the tag line. Let's talk about boat stability. Just a couple pictures here. Um, the uh, again, stability really becomes a uh, is a big issue, and um, I, we can't begin to cover all of the types of examples. But we just want to give uh, some basic fundamentals. Um, uh, on the far left, this uh, is actually a, a, a what we call a sea anchor. There's a couple other types of names for it, but it basically it's a little net that can be deployed behind the river cat. Uh, it works. It, it tends to work very well in this case. In this picture, the wind was uh, was going upstream, uh, and the, the water velocities downstream were on the order of maybe five to six centimeters per second. So what would happen is the boat would, would actually be pushed by the wind under the bridge. Uh, once we deployed this, this little sea anchor, it was able, the, the, the current was able to actually pull against the anchor and keep the boat downstream and actually keep it very stable. Uh, another, you see the middle plot here, this is, a tri, this is a, the ADP on a tri-hull, and it actually has a stabilizing bar. This was not, this is not built or developed by Sontag. This is a, a customer application down in South Africa. And uh, in this case, you can see that they have two stabilizing bars, and that's to keep them, the, again, to minimize the motion of the boat. Also allow them to orient the instrument at very specific locations uh, at very, at, across the stream. Uh, on the far on the far right, you see again a, a little bit larger tri hull again with the river cat there, and you see the counterweight. This is this weight uh, for some of you. I'm sure it looks familiar. Uh, it's hung from a bank operated cableway, and uh, in this case, uh, they're using the weight to lower the scope of that line or the angle that the line. You can see the blue line. Uh, the lower that that is, the less that that river cat will have a tendency to pull up. Uh, in high flows, you're, you're going to have a tendency, for those of you who have made these measurements, you're, you're quite familiar with this, uh, when, when the boat is, uh, when you have a lot of tension on that line at a very sharp angle, it'll have a tendency to pull the hulls up, and then you'll get cavitation under the transducer. So if you can lower the scope, that's actually going to allow you to work in much higher velocities. Here's just a couple pulley ideas. Uh, actually, all of these photos have come down from uh, uh, have, have come from the Department of Water Affairs in South Africa. They've done a, a lot of excellent work in developing 
quick deployment techniques for pulleys and uh, using cableways, using both moving boat and stationary. Uh, here on the upper uh, left, you can see it's, uh, well, they have a, a, a survey device there, but look past that, you can see the pulley on the right and uh, the, the river cat with the stabilizers on it. They're able, again, to actually measure distances very precisely and go to very precise locations across the river. Uh, again, on the lower left and the up, the the upper, on, on the lower middle plot or figure, and the upper right, it's actually the same site, uh, just two different angles, uh, which they have the river cat just tied up by its basic bridle, again to a pulley system that the uh, hydrographer can can correctly position this instrument as it goes back and forth across the river. Again, keep in mind that st stability is a big issue and position. Is, is obviously an issue, so these pulleys work quite well. Flow conditions. Most flow conditions are acceptable. I think one thing, and, and generally in the feedback we get is that uh, it's a pretty robust method, and uh, again, if we can position the boat at a, at a good location, we, and, and we can typically measure a very good velocity profile and a depth, um, and it's, uh, again, so stability and positioning are really key to the particular flow condition. Uh, again, based on a lot of feedback that we get here, uh, we've had extremely good positive feedback in the really low velocities uh, and, in, and in really the high velocities. I, th I think, again, uh, in the low velocities, uh, turbulence scales in the river. Uh, when you start to average the instrument at, at a fixed location for 40 to 60 seconds, you begin to pick up a really good representation of the mean velocity. I'd also like to add that uh, you're not fixed to a, either the 40 or 60 second averaging. I mean, if, if you would like to average out more of the uh, kind of temporal variations in the river, the short term temporal variations, you can average for longer. You can average it, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes, whatever you like, um, just to, uh, to make sure that you're getting a good velocity profile. And again, in the high velocity conditions, floods with a lot of turbulence, a lot of high sediments, uh, things get really complicated very quickly. Of course, safety is always an issue. Uh, other issues come into play like the, the bottom tracking or the, lo or the ability to have um, uh, deep uh, quality differential service. So, the, uh, so again, in, in, in the flood or extreme conditions, this we, we've seen results that the, uh, the, the, that the results are very good. Standard conditions really apply for all ADPs, similar in stationary as in moving boat. We want to avoid things like air entrainment, cavitation, and the like. So now let's talk about the depths. I mean, uh, typically you can use the depth that's measured from the bottom track using the ADP, and that's displayed automatically. You don't have to do anything, and uh, it displays the, the depth measured by the bottom track at the bottom of the, in the measurement results section. What you can also do is that if you have an alternative source for the depth measurement, let's say for example an echo sounder, a uh, survey rod or, or some other device, you can override that depth measurement that's made by the bottom track and enter in the, your own value. Uh, you may do this in situations where you have uh, high sediment loads where it's actually difficult to, to identify the bottom or in cases where um, you may have lots of vegetation growth as well. So. The, the other advantage that you have with this is that you can now actually uh, add in depths and make velocity measurements in uh, depths which are actually greater than the range of the actual system itself. Two of the key things when you make a stationary measurement is, first of all, you have to make compass calibration, and second is you have to measure the azimuth. Now, it's the same as, uh, calibrating the compass is the same as what you do for a moving boat measurement. You must make a compass calibration, and quite a lot of people forget to do that. It is good procedure to always make a compass calibration each time you go out to a site. The compass calibration is the same for the uh, moving boat procedure, and uses the same controls. Second step is to measure the azimuth. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Typically. Uh, we suggest that you orient the system from the left, le left bank to the right bank and using the compass in the system you can measure the angle of the tagline with north. Uh, the software has capability for uh, allowing you to enter those values and it gives you a description of that procedure as well. 
there is another way in which case you actually orient the system with the flow and you position the system typically in the center of your cross section and then you subtract 90 degrees mm -hmm. from the angle that you measure and you use that as typically as, as your azimuth. Uh, just one, one comment I want to make about the calibration, uh, the compass calibration that is. Again, we, we, want to be, we want to be careful, as always, when we calibrate these. And again, sometimes we're deploying these from a bridge or from a walkway. Uh, it's important when you, just as a basic rule, when, you, when we do this calibration, that we want to, we want to do it as near the, the measurement location as possible. Uh, a lot of cases that we've seen, not a lot, but in, in certain cases we've seen calibrations performed up on the bridge where the bridge is loaded with steel, and so when they lower it down down into the river, the, 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 the compass really isn't calibrated. So uh, make sure, just a, a, a rule of thumb, you should try to make the calibration measurement as, quick, as close to the uh, actual measurement location and avoid any types of steel, large metal objects. All right? A little bit about the basic rules. Uh, basic rules are, are really hard to describe, especially when you consider uh, everybody in the world using different methodologies and different rules. But some of the there are some basics. Uh, the number and spacing of the stations. Uh, typically, uh, if we stick to this what we call this five percent rule, which is basically we want to try to keep no more than five percent of the total flow within any, within any one station. Uh, typically, the number of stations is going to be on the order of about 20 or more. Uh, the spacing, uh, quite com it's quite common or quite easy uh, to just use equal spacing. Uh, the software actually allows you, uh, similar to the flow tracker software, for those of you who have used that, to vary the, the width. Uh, typically, you know, the flow is, uh, is greater in the middle part of the river than it is on the edges, so it's it's good procedure to vary your spacing as you go across. Wider stations along the edges where there's less flow and narrower stations, narrow, a narrower spacing for each station towards the middle of the river. Uh, again, that's going to kind of keep you within that 5% rule. Sample time, uh, again, we can't sit here and recommend a sample time. Uh, the, the, the minimum sample time I've, I've seen just, uh, just uh, from, our, from my travels is about 40 seconds. Again, because we're not measuring a two tenths or an eight tenths or a six tenths, uh, we typically, you know, recommend starting at about 60 seconds. Uh, that's just to give a pretty good structure. Matt, you want to comment on that? Well, once again, as I mentioned earlier, you can vary that sample time, uh, anything from, you know, even uh, several minutes if you like. Uh, it, all it does is it just increases your operational time. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and again, it's just stick with whatever your particular agency uh, uh, recommends at this time. And the mean velocity, and well, well, mean velocity and estimating the top and the bottom, again, those uh, mean velocity is calculated from the velocity data and the top and bottom estimate that we calculate. The top and bottom, or the unmeasured sections, if we will, uh, are, you, are typically used using a velocity profile extrapolation. Uh, a power curve or a constant fit. It's very similar for those of you that have made the moving boat measurements. It's actually identical. Um, and then measuring depth using the ADP or the, uh, the other sensor, which Matthew actually has already talked about. Um, again, when you measure depth, you can use the ADP or actually if you have other, some type of uh, graduated uh, rod or echo sounder, uh, you can al also use that. Again, according to just your agency standards. Okay, now we're going to go through the software and, and uh, typically what you see and, and how you go through actually making uh, a stationary measurement. Software starts out, it's, it's a very basic screen. Uh, it provides all the information that you need to get started. Um, you can see at the top here that we have connection options so we can connect to the ADP. This is for your real-time measurements. Second step is looking at data files, so you can have a look at data files after they've been collected. It, it stores a history of the last few files that you actually looked at. And the, last, uh, the second last section is the documentation and support. Now we have links to the online quick start uh, and also the, uh, the, the manual is also available uh, with the software. Um, and then the last one of all is the program settings and the versions of the software. 
if you need to change things like um, the report language, the unit system that you're using, well, these things are all changed in that bottom section, the change program settings link. Yeah, one thing, Matt, I, I want to comment uh, to the viewers right now. The, uh, we're not going to give you a live demonstration of the software today, um, but however, at the end of this uh, webinar, you can, you're going to be provided with a survey form, I believe, and in that survey form, if you would like to have a live demonstration, uh, we, we will be glad to make, uh, make that available. And um, again, just running with this application to, today, it was, it, was, it was impossible. So for those of you that uh, would like to have a live demonstration of the software, uh, we can do that in the future and just make your comments known in the, uh, in the feedback. Thank you. Next we're going to look at actually making a measurement. So we've, we've clicked on that connect to a system on the previous page and what happens is it searches out, finds the ADP on the connection that you've provided and displays the system information for this particular system. Now what we're looking at here is a, a 3000 kilohertz or 3 megahertz ADP uh, it shows you the system settings, so what the actual hardware is configured for. Uh, the, sorry, in the system information section. System settings, these are the settings that you can actually change yourself for the system, such as profiling range and uh, any modifications that you need to make for things like uh, salinity and temperature. Last of all is the data collection settings. So here we're looking at what you, how you're going to actually make that measurement. So for example, things like the averaging time, and this is where you can change it from default, which is like 40 seconds, anything up to 60 seconds, minute and a half, whatever you need. And last of all is where you're actually going to store that data afterwards. The other good thing is that the software is set up. I mean, when you're out in the field, it can be very difficult to mess around with, with a mouse or with the, uh, the touchpad on your laptop. So you can also see that we have keyboard shortcuts that can actually run you through the software. And in most cases, the default is actually just pressing the enter key. So on that first page, actually, if you press the enter key, you can step through to this page. On this page, when you actually have, if you have your system already preset up, you can just hit the enter key again and you jump straight to the next page. It's all very simple. So what are we going to do right at the start of the measurement? Well, we're going to enter in our site information. I mean, how does this affect your, your measurement? Well, for the, for the most part, this first set of information that you're going to be entering is basically for your record keeping purposes. We recommend that you enter in as much information into this section as possible because you benefit from it when you're going in and retrospectively looking at, uh, at data sets and trying to work out exactly what happened. So we definitely recommend entering in all your information on the site, measurement, particularly comment section uh, about particular conditions for that, that measurement and that particular day. In that central section here, we have a look at the general measurement information. So here we're going to enter information on which edge you're going to start on. In this case, it's the REW, or the right edge of water. Then the next one is the rate of discharge. Now, sometime, uh, this is the rate of discharge for the particular conditions that you've gone out at the site. Now, this information is not always available, but we do recommend making a, an estimate of the, rate of the discharge at the particular site on that day. It's a good way to get a reference for the flows as you're making the measurement across the cross-section. And as we saw previously, on the graph, on the top graph, it showed you a percentage discharge. Now, when you enter in a rate of discharge value here, that percentage discharge is calculated using this rate of discharge value at this point. Next one is the azimuth, and this is where you enter in that value that we talked about earlier about the azimuth. On each of these steps, as you're clicking through, that left central sec that left uh, sorry that yellow section in the center displays a description and examples of how you enter in information for each of these boxes so for example when we do go down here and click on the rate of discharge and the azimuth this page here does update to give you additional information a diagram whatever to make it easier for you to step through this procedure the next ones are the water level start and end and these are typically for your gauge heights uh, that you're going to use uh, as you're progressing through the measurement. When you get to the end, it's going to show you the range of water levels that you've seen. And last of all is the measurement quality, which you're going to typically enter in at the end. Yeah, so just a comment about the water level. 
you can also actually while you're collecting the, the, the velocity and depth data at each station, you you'll be allowed to also enter in a water level as, as yes. you go. Yes. On the right hand side, you can see that we've got a site photo um, showing a walkway over a canal that you saw previously. It's good to enter in a site photo. It just adds additional information to a measurement, and uh, it's good for when you're going back and, and, and looking over a measurement a second time. Once again, as, as you're going through and you're stepping through the software, you're just hitting the enter key for the most part if things are progressing uh, as planned. Uh, it does make things easier to make the measurement, you know, messing around with the, the keyboard for the most part. Here we're going to start with entering in the information for the start edge. So here we enter the location of this start edge, the water depth, the gauge height, the any auxiliary gauge height information, a velocity correction factor, which is typically going to remain at 1, the depth of the transducers, and water surface conditions. Now the water surface conditions in most cases is going to be open water, as you can see in this nice little diagram on the right hand side. But if you are working in ice or ice and slush conditions, you can change this option to select either ice or ice and slush, and you can see the actual diagram updates with the ice and slush shown on this and the ADP in the middle. And you can enter in values for the ice depth and the slush depth as well. And that assists in how the discharge measurement is actually made and how discharge is calculated. OK, so now we're actually going to make a measurement. So we've progressed to the first station. We're actually collecting data. When you start collecting data, you can see this little kind of symbol of a clock starts clicking around and as it goes around as the actual me measurement is progressing. You can see that all of this information you've entered in here for the particular station is, is displayed. In this central kind of plot, you can see the amplitude or signal strength of the uh, three beams of the ADP. On this graph next to it, you can see the velocity profile shown from the top, from the water surface, all the way down to the bottom. The bottom of the, uh, of the river is shown as this grey section here, and that depth in this particular case is taken from the bottom track. The way I can tell that's the case is no one has entered a, a particular user depth. If that value is kept at zero, then it uses the, the bottom track value for the, uh, for the depth measurement. On this right side here, you can see a picture of the ADP, the beams coming down, and you can see what happens when you're actually making the measurement. You'll see a little uh, signal being transmitted from the top to the bottom, kind animated. of showing that the it's animated, and, yeah. and it shows that the, uh, the system is in action. When you have a look at this velocity profile here from the top to the bottom, you can see the extrapolation method here. There's the blue line here at the top and at the bottom. Each of these gray lines represents individual profiles made within those 40 seconds, so that you can see that distribution of the velocity measurements over time. In this case, we have some level of, t of uh, variation and some sort of turbulence in situations where you get very stable flow. Those gray lines should overlay particularly well with the red line, or in cases where there's high turbulence, those gray lines will show more variation. When the 40 seconds is up, what happens is this clock here hits the top and it stops the measurement automatically. Next step is that you've gone through, you've made those measurements at every one of your stations and you've entered in your end edge information. It's all the same for each of the stations. Uh, there's nothing new for each one. When you get to the end and you have a look at your data, you can see the three plots we talked about earlier, percentage discharge, your normalized velocities in the blue, the true velocity shown in the red, and the depth profile here. You can see here, this is where you make an assessment of your measurement. You can see here that um, the flows are all typically in the 5 to 10 percent or lower. Uh, if necessary, if you were looking at particular panels and they were indicated in red, showing that they were above the particular threshold, in this case is, is 10 percent for a particular panel, then you would go back and you have the option of subsectioning a particular panel, adding in additional panels, whatever you like, that, uh, to make a more evenly distributed velocity uh, uh, flow measurement. Yeah, so it's very similar again in the, in, in the, with the flow tracker or with other conventional meters. Uh, again, is that if we could, we, once we are finished with the measurement or at any time during the measurement, we can go back and, and split a station in half. For example, say 
we're measuring it at 10 meters and then we have another measurement at 15 meters and another measurement at 20, well we can go back and input a measurement at 12 and a half and split, basically split that station in half. On the report, you're, you're going to know that you've done this by the time tag. So it time tags every measurement, so you'll, see, you'll still see the calculation. It will, it will dovetail in that extra section, uh, but in the, in the actual the time tag, you'll see that the time uh, was, was much different than the, the uh, adjoining stations. So let's look at uh, reviewing data. You've gone out, you've collected your data, you're back in the office, and you're going to have a look at it. Or you're reviewing someone else's data set. What you're typically going to look at is the variations in the percentage discharge per station, and this is what you can see up in this top top graph here. If there was any station shown in red, that's a flag that uh, percentage discharge exceeds what is required by your organisation. You look at the depths. You look at these depths that you're seeing across the cross-section. Do they make sense? I mean, if you have a concrete trapezoidal channel, do the depths that you actually see match what you expect? The next one is the velocity distribution. Does that match what you're expecting as well? Do these uh, velocities show a fairly even distribution or a distribution which matches the depths that you're seeing and the sort of flow conditions that you're expecting as well? The next one is we're going to compare the true versus the normalized velocities. So what we're doing is we're going to look at these blue arrows and we're going to look at these red arrows here. And to show the true velocity on the plot, you can just right click here and select true velocity and the arrows pop up. What you're typically doing is you're looking at the angle between those blue and red lines. And if there's not a lot of variation, well, that, that typically means that your tagline is oriented with uh, perpendicular to the flow. Yeah. In situations where you get, may get high variation, for example, the red lines are, are oscillating back and forth across the, uh, the channel cross-section, then in that particular case, maybe you've got, you're getting a lot of uh, variable flow conditions. In a situation where you have those red lines all oriented um, at a, what looks like a, a fairly constant angle across the cross-section, that indicates two things. One, either you've measured, uh, you, well, actually a few things. Possibly you've made an incorrect compass calibration, you haven't measured your azimuth correctly, or the third thing is that your tagline, that everything may be okay and your tagline is not oriented perpendicular to the flow. So this is typically where you go back, you have a look at the azimuth, and you make sure that everything is okay. Yeah, and again, this is this is why this this compass comes into being quite critical for the quality of the measurement itself. Once again, when we're having a look, having a look at the data review, you can go back and just by clicking on these tabs down the bottom here, you can click on the stations tab and have a look through each of the individual stations just to make sure that everything looks okay. You can you can look at a particular station just by clicking on it in this graphic and in this particular case we've clicked on this particular station and it's highlighted here. At each station you're going to look at the depths, do they make sense? The actual flow, you know, are we getting an even distribution, a relatively even distribution of flow across each panel? Uh, the velocities themselves, the edges, have you put in the edges correctly? The distances uh, that are measured at the edges, do they make sense? The other one is the velocity variation, are we looking at these? How much variation are we seeing across the, the profile e extrapolation? Last of all is, is the actual profile extrapolation technique that you're using. In this particular case, a 1-6 power curve is a good fit. In other cases, that may not necessarily be the case, and that you may need to use other techniques such as the constant, or you may need to vary how you're applying that extrapolation at the top and at the bottom. You can go and, and, and uh, display the profile extrapolation dialog, make changes to it, and actually see how it updates uh, without having to exit that dialogue itself. The final step is that everything's good, uh, measurements been QA'd and it's been reviewed and everything looks good, so you display the report. Now the report, we've got a new format now that mirrors the, um, well, to, to as much as possible, the flow tracker format. And so what you have is you have all of the standard information on the site, system information summary for your discharge measurement, each of the particular stations. On the second page, you also have all of the graphics that you've seen before in the, with the flow tracker measurements as well. This is all now a part of the software of a new version that we will be releasing uh, in early July. Uh, yeah, one comment here. We want to talk about this. Uh, if you look in the uh, report, 
or the discharge measurement summary is the discharge. We actually do uh, discharge uncertainty calculations. Um, I just want to make a couple comments about that. Uh, first of all, again, it's very similar to what we're doing with the flow tracker. Uh, basically, all, all the uncertainty calculations or values uh, are, are based on one standard deviation uncertainties, and it, bas it represents a confidence level of 68%. Uh, there's two methods that we use, the ISO uncertainty calculation. It's based on an international standard and provides users with the, uh, the results you know, of a, it's, it's a published and standard technique. Uh, we found, however, in some cases, it, it doesn't appear to provide a reliable indicator of, of the true data quality. Uh, the, the second calculation is the statistical uncertainty calculation, or at least that's what we call it. It's a, it's a method uh, developed by researchers at the U.S. Geological Survey Water Resource Division. This, uh, the calculation provides a basically a more reliable indicator of the measurement quality. I'll, I'll keep it short for right now. Uh, ag again, uh, keep in mind that uh, one of our ideas of the discharge uncertainty is to get some some level of understanding of how the overall quality of the measurement was in terms of in, in, in terms of a percent. All right. Thanks, Pat. The other thing with the report is that we also offer multi-language options. These are changed in the in the program settings section, and we offer options for uh, displaying the report in. Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, Italian, German, French, uh, Portuguese. Um, I think there's eight languages in total that we offer, and it just updates the report automatically uh, with the language settings. Uh, the advantage for this is that uh, you can match any sort of requirements that you have for your department if uh, you're working in a different language, and also that your report now kind of mirrors the uh, the flow tracker multi-language report a little bit better as well. Okay, so actually that's, that's the, the, the extent of our presentation today for the stationary, you know, describing the stationary method software. I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes uh, where we can take some questions. We've already had some come in uh, during, during the discussion. And just one more comment, again, on the live, the actual live demonstration, we can uh, do this in the future and just uh, provide us with your comments uh, if you have interest in that. So Matthew, I've got uh, the, the first question that we have here. Uh, what are the possibilities of flow velocity measurements near in, in the near bed zone and blank zones? Uh, basically, they, they comment uh, that it's important for calculating bed load transport in a, in a riverbed. Um, first of all, one of the one of the limitations of a, of an ADP in general or any type of profiler are these unmeasured zones. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, there's a there's a top zone which includes the actual depth of the transducer in a, in a blank zone that's unmeasured by the instrument, and then because of the interference signal interference towards the river bed, we we typically chop off somewhere between five to ten percent, or seven I should say seven to ten percent of the bottom of the profile because of, of signal interference, and so uh, in this case it's it's very similar again we are being able to get these moving bed you know, we are to be able to look at pretty good uh, measurements of the moving bed, but still in terms of the, the bed load, uh, about as close as we can get is a, still about 7 to 10 percent without it getting any type of contamination. Okay. We did have a question earlier about what is the, uh, the gray area at the bottom. Let me just go back to a particular slide. What is this gray area at the bottom here uh, of the uh, the graphs? What that is is the uh, the bottom of the river as detected by the bottom track in this particular case. If you were to override it and put in the values that say you uh, received from an echo sounder or other device, then the depth would be displayed using that value instead of what you got from the bottom track. Yeah, and, and if you're looking on both of those plots, you see the velocity plot, you see the velocity is actually going into the riverbed. Uh, that, that's really not true. We, 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 we plot that data just for display purposes, and it gives it, the users a, a better idea of actually where the bottom is. The, on the signal plot, again, you can see it's similar that, uh, you know, a large part of the signal is, appears to be going about a meter or so into the riverbed. That's really not the case. Uh, again, we just do that for display purposes. But the gray line is the actual depth. Uh, the top of that plot represents zero, represents the water surface. Okay. 
what is the minimum depth and what is the maximum cross-sectional width given the 20 measurement requirement? Okay, let's talk about the minimum depth. The minimum depth is going to be based on the frequency of the transducer that you're using. Uh, in the case, for example, of the 3 megahertz, uh, the, the, the minimum measurement depth uh, typically, depending upon the, the, the bed conditions, will run between 55 to 60 centimeters. Uh, the, the minimum cross-sectional width, uh, that's, I don't know, Matthew, if you have a comment about that. Um, typically, the, uh, I think the, the minimum I've seen the stationary measurement you physically used in is something on the order of 4 or 5 meters. Yeah, that's about uh, as, uh, as narrow as I've seen it as well. Again, I, I think that's pretty much up for you to decide. Again, remember, you're going to be collecting just some, you, you, with each, each time you collect data, you, you really have to make a judgment, is that a valid velocity and a valid depth, and make that judgment for yourself. So the, the minimum width is it's just going to vary on your ability to position that instrument. Uh, if you have a big boat in a, in a little river, obviously it's going to affect the width. Uh, the, and, and it said, I guess, considering the 20 measurement requirement. Again, this is going back. Uh, the the require it's it's not really a requirement. It's just a very common rule uh, that that seems to be consistent across you know a consistent worldwide. However, if you're in very dynamic conditions or rapidly changing flow, or there's a lot of conditions where uh, you can justify reducing the number of cross sections uh, or the number of stations if time becomes a factor. So again, the 20 measurement rule is really just as a as a starter and. Uh, Remember, just to follow the rules of your particular agency for their, their, their measurement procedures. Yeah, we should add that in a particular case like where we've seen a, a five meter wide channel, if you have 20 sections, that's 25, meter, uh, 25 centimeter stations, it's kind of not all that practical and people will typically go down to something like say 10 stations in that, in that particular case. Likewise, if you've got a particularly wide river with uh, lots of variation across it, it, it's not unusual to see people making the number of uh, making measurements at uh, stations more than 25, even more than 30, all that is required is that you just spend more time out in the field me making measurements. Yep. Okay, the next question here from Ryan asked, uh, asked about sediment concentrations affecting uh, a measurement. How, how can you tell if the concentration will be too high for the system to work? Does it affect velocities or just the depth measurement? Well, your depth measurement, I mean, uh, is, is coming from the bottom track, and sometimes in particularly uh, high, con high concentration sediment, it can affect it, particularly for low-frequency systems. In those cases, you can use uh, a second depth input, uh, for example, things like uh, a very low-frequency echo sounder, like we've seen in certain places like in China, people use those. Um, it should not affect your velocity measurement because you have more scatterers in the water. Typically, it's going to affect your depth measurement and, and typically truncate it early. Yeah, yeah. and one way that you can tell, well, well first a comment about the concentration. Um, the, uh, if, if it's too high, or what does a high concentration do? It will reduce the range of the, of the system. Okay, if, for example, if the three megahertz has a range to five meters, in normal conditions and maybe in high, very high sediment conditions, the maximum range might be reduced to, to two meters. The system will, will, will know how far it can actually measure valid velocity, datas, uh, velocity data, and it will only collect data at that point. Uh, another, another comment about that is that if the, um, if, again, if the concentration becomes extremely too high, you just will, you won't get any return. The velocity data, though, that it returns, even if with the high sediments, will be valid. So, high concentration affects the range, but not velocities. We've had a question about uh, how the measurement procedure varies when you're uh, making an ice measurement. From the software perspective, the really the only variation that you're going to have when you're making a measurement is that right here, when you say select the water surface conditions, you're going to select Instead of open water, you're going to select ice or ice and slush, and you'll have to make measurements of the ice, ice depth and the slush depth um, based on the standard procedure for your organization. What that does is that changes how the velocity profile is extrapolated at the top because you're going to get you know, zero flow at that, uh, that ice slush interface. The other thing is 
that the rest of the procedure is pretty much identical. So you're going to have your stations marked out. The only difference is that you're not going to be using a, 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 a floating platform. You're going to be using some sort of rod to attach the, the uh, system to and you're going to just lower that beyond that sort of slush horizon area so that you're actually not getting uh, a lot of interference from the slush on the actual transistors themselves. Okay, uh, Paul has a question here. Does increasing the baud rate quicken the response rate? Uh, he says it takes about 5 to 10 seconds after the 40 second measurement to get the results. Uh, you can quicken the, the board rate. Uh, sometimes you have the limitation that uh, radios are, are functioning at 9600 board. Um, if you are running at a, a quicker board rate, it, can, it will, of course, accelerate that little procedure from uh, when it uh, stops the measurement. But all in all, that um, the 5 to 10, to 10 seconds that you're waiting at the end when it closes up the measurement and does the, the calculation, it's not all that long compared to the entire operational time. And actually, Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not actually collecting data during that five to 10 seconds. No. So Paul, what I would recommend is that you, you uh, once you see that little hourglass, you can begin to reposition the, the instrument uh, and, and, you know, to, the next, to, to the next location. Okay, so again, it just quickened. I, I know what you mean, I've collect, uh, you know, I've used, uh, I've, I've experienced that, between, you know, not really 10 seconds, but it seems to be about five seconds um, that we, we typically have to wait. And again, once the little hourglass comes up, it's basically done its measurement, it's doing its processing, and we move on to the next station and hit accept kind of as we're on the way or as we're at the next station. Yeah, it's, it's also saving the data to a file on your PC so that you're getting that uh, continuous uh, data collection. Yeah. Um, the next question we have is the availability and, and the cost of the stationary measurement software. Uh, stationary, the stationary software is available for all of our river surveyor systems, river cat, river surveyor systems. Um, you can purchase it at, at, at the time when you get your system or you can purchase it later. Uh, the, the cost for the software is 1500 US. Okay, Mike has a question. How can, how can you determine what the SNR, what the SNR is? For, for those of you listening, uh, the SNR is a signal to noise ratio, and it's a calculation performed by every uh, uh, all of our ADPs. Matthew, on these graphs here, in the uh, when you're looking at um, the the station plots, uh, you can see here that it's showing amplitude and normalized speed. You have the option of right clicking uh, on the bottom axis and actually changing that. You can display the uh, signal to noise ratio on one of those plots if you choose. You, you can have the option of even displaying amplitude twice if you choose. Um, but the, the option for selecting the parameters displayed here is totally up to you. By default it will show the amplitude and the normalized speed. Okay, I think we have, we have uh, time really for just one last question here. It's what is the, the maximum depth of the 3 megahertz ADP? Uh, the, the maximum depth is, it, it will vary slightly, but t in, in normal conditions it should, it should be about five and a half to six meters. Um, the, uh, one, one, again, one comment about measuring depth with the stationary is that the, that's the maximum depth for the velocity measurement typically will run to about five and a half, five, five and a half or six meters. However, I can input a depth maybe six, seven or eight meters if I so choose and the, uh, the velocity of the extrapolation will pick up the unmeasured section. The, uh, again, we're not recommending that you do that, but it, again, it's something that you kind of have, have to make the judgment yourself. Uh, again, if you can input a depth that, that exceeds the velocity range of the instrument, sometimes that might be appropriate, sometimes it may not. Okay. Well, one thing I did want to add is that uh, we're always welcome to suggestions uh, and comments from people regarding uh, the software in our systems. Uh, so we do welcome people emailing and contacting us regarding suggestions that they have for the software. Please do keep in mind that we, we can't uh, incorporate every suggestion, but we do appreciate appreciate them. And we do try our best to, uh, when, whenever we do an update, to incorporate as many of those suggestions and changes as possible. Okay, one, one more question. What is the lowest reasonable velocity? Um, I, I, would, I would have to say zero, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, if again the instrument has uh, 
I, I don't have the specifications, the spec sheet sitting in front of me. The, the lowest reasonable velocity really is a, it just a, it's going to vary from site to site. Uh, if I'm in really good conditions and I can have good control over my boat, it's, it's not moving, it's not being blown around by the wind, there's no vegetation, I, I could easily resolve, and, and I had a nice sampling average of maybe 60 to 120 seconds, or maybe even more, I could, I, could e I could easily work in velocities down to the centimeters per second. Uh, that's, again, that's a function of the turbulent scales in the river itself. You know, when the velocities are extremely low, that, that low, we need an adequate amount of averaging time to, to get a true mean velocity, to get a good representation of the mean. So again, the lowest reasonable velocity, uh, I would say in, in, pra in, in your most typical conditions, practically, on the order of four to three to four to five centimeters per second. Uh, however, when you go get down that low, uh, it, the sampling time comes into uh, to play, and you'll you'll probably have to increase your sampling time from maybe 40 to 80, 90, 120 seconds. Okay. All right. Are we um, okay? So I've been told that it's time to stop talking, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> but we'd like to thank both Matthew and I. Like to thank you for attending. Uh, we hope the, the webinar has been a, a benefit to you. Uh, we haven't had, hopefully, we haven't had too many blunders on the way. Um, we're going to be uh, make this available for rebroadcast, uh, for rebroadcast, um, and you can contact uh, Sontech YSI for any specific questions uh, at, at support at sontech.com and uh, visit our website at www.sontech.com. All right, thank you again, and uh, Matthew, any parting words? Uh, I mean, once again, we're always open to any suggestions, and uh, thank you for your participation. Very good. Have a good day. Thanks.